Welcome everyone. This is the winter 2020 gathering of the Minnesota SCG Roundtable. Some of you are new today, some of you are old timers, but we've been gathering quarterly for the past few years to share information about the developments taking place inside our state and all over the planet in terms of the 2030 goals for global sustainable development. Today, we have a really special opportunity. Uh, we'll be hearing back from folks who were official representatives of the roundtables that were uh, taking place over the last month or so here in Minnesota that are part of a national forum, SDG forum. It really was the first time there had been such a national forum. And so we are very fortunate to have that opportunity today. We're able to do these programs to host roundtables and to be part of national discussions and international discussion because of the very generous support of our sponsors, but primarily for the generosity of our members. Many of you watching today are members. Thank you so much. It's your contributions, your support makes this and many other programs possible. For those of you who consider joining, today would be the perfect time. Anyone who joins now to the end of the year gets a free admission to the special Tom Hansen. He's our diplomat in residence in our whole region. Uh, his special foreign policy overview, which is probably the top attended event that we have during the course of our year. So thank you to all of you who've supported today. Thank you for the work that you do to bring the sustainable development goals to life in your work and in other parts of the planet. And we're gonna to move to our first report. So let me just do a little background. Uh, Global Washington, our cousin organization out in the beautiful Pacific coast, uh, had this great idea that nationwide, we should be talking about the SDGs at the local level and then bringing our insights back to a national forum, a national discussion. Um, Minnesota was approached to be one of the organizations, the goalkeepers uh, around the country. We took a responsibility for hosting local gatherings of uh, experts and, and people who are working in the areas of SDG 2, which is zero hunger, uh, SDG 4, quality education, and SDG 12, sustainable consumption and production. Representatives from those three gathered with others and a whole national um, conference. And we're going to hear today from our three representatives and from the amazing leader, the CEO and president of Global Washington, whose idea this was and who brought this all together. Uh, she'll be the final panelist today, bringing that whole perspective together. And we'll have some conversation and questions. If you have questions or comments, you can see there on the YouTube channel in the box, there's a place to send questions. Also some links where you can go see the recorded sessions and some of the amazing background materials that are available. So we're gonna start with Anne Costell, who is the director of coffee at Peace Coffee. Some of you are able to stay awake and watch this thanks to their incredible product. Uh, Anne, turning it over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, firstly, thank you for this opportunity. It's it's great to be part of this broader conversation. Lots to learn, and uh, it's been a real pleasure to 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 talk to everyone and and learn more, and then continue to do really good work. Um, so my name is Anne Costello. I'm the director of coffee at Peace Coffee. Uh, so Peace Coffee, I always say peace, not it may it may come through as Pete, which is a, a much larger. Um, coffee roaster, but we are located in Minneapolis. We are 100% fair trade and organic B Corp certified coffee roaster. Um, so our mission is to produce a delicious cup of coffee that sustains the livelihoods of the people who grow, roast, and sell it, and also protects the environment that produces it. So in our conversation, um, we really talked about movement building and how movement building um, can inform um, and help move forward uh, some of the SDGs. So, you know, our conversation really started with, we've seen movements come in, in into the limelight in 2020 from Black Lives Matter, climate change. Um, we also have COVID as a backdrop, which has set back a lot of the SDGs. So forcing people into lockdowns and things like that. So the question, that really started the conversation was what was one lesson that social movements learned in 2020 that can help sustain the momentum of SDGs? 
Um, I loved this conversation and this and the, and the question, the question that started the conversation. Um, you know, COVID put a, a spotlight on deeply problematic issues that that already exist, and then many social movements have been actively working to address these for for decades. So when I think of of COVID, it's a time where we are, you know, being We've, we've never felt more disconnected in a lot of ways. Um, we may be in lockdown, we may be spending much more time alone, we are trying to keep the people in our families, our communities safe, um, yet we see all these social movements that we need to start working towards. Um, so so for me, one, one quote that came to mind, and, and I love this quote, was, we all do better when we all do better. This is a quote from Paul Wellstone, so I won't take, um, it's a brilliant quote, a simple one that, that definitely um, it has deep meaning. So for me, this quote serves as a reminder of our interconnectedness and our interdependence, especially during a time of chaos. Um, so, you know, the movements that we talk about, um, they share many different goals, but they have so many commonalities as well. And we need to support each other to build a better world. So message is simple. We all do better when we all do better, but the meaning is complex. And um, so we really talked about in order for our work to move forward, we need each other. Our, our work cannot move forward without others working towards other SDGs. Um, so the interconnectedness um, of the speakers on the panel and also how the SDGs work together to create a better world is something we really talked a lot about and highlighted. Um, we also talked about how consumers um, can, can engage with movements that can help um, further humanitarian development goals and, and the SDGs. So, uh, from Peace Coffee's perspective, we talked a little bit about the fair trade movement and the B Corp movement. So for, for coffee specifically, I won't go into too many details and get too dorky here, although I could, I could go on for hours. Um, uh, it's a little bit of background about how coffee is produced. There's estimated over 12 million coffee farms throughout the world and over 125 million people who depend on their, on coffee for their livelihoods. 80% of coffee farmers are smallholder farmers um, and coffee is traded in 40,000 pound increments. So uh, against that backdrop, how do you create um, radical change, make sure that farmers get fair prices, that they can have a sustainable livelihood, that they can um, protect the environment in which their farms are located. Um, so, so a little bit about fair trade and that movement is it's simply a, a vision um, for an economy based on solidarity. So for us, you know, fair trade supports small farmer cooperatives. So democratically organized um, groups of farmers come together and these offer really powerful economies of scale um, and, and also access to transparent information, um, also agronomic and technical assistance. Uh, so coffee is typically traded off of a commodity market, which in, in theory should reflect supply and demand, but oftentimes doesn't. Um, so what fair trade really, really works to do is, is say, um, when the market is low, when it's disconnected from the cost of production, we're not going to follow that. So, you know, from our, our job as a roaster, it's to create a product and broadcast a message so consumers can understand why we cost more on the shelf. If the market is low, we're not going to follow it down. We're always going to follow it up and make sure that we have those conversations and those direct relationships with our producers on the ground um, to pay sustainable prices and, and, and make coffee a, a sustainable livelihood and also the long term piece as well. So long-term relationships, Peace Coffee believes in long-term relationships. You can't make change overnight. You need time um, to do that. So, so these are the, some of the tenets of fair trade that really work towards SDGs and consumers can engage with that by buying fair trade products. Um, B Corp is another movement where I think consumers can have a lot of an engagement around SDGs. So B Corp is a global movement of people using business as a force for good. It really makes sure that your mission, that your work, um, you can't just say you do something and not do it and be a B Corp certified business. It's really making sure that your mission is locked into the DNA of the of the business and, and every decision at every level really takes that mission into account. Um, so this is this is another piece that I think is is a, a opportunity for consumers to engage with SDGs. Um, B Corp also has uh, an ability for it through an assessment tool for companies 
to assess their progress towards UN Sustainable Development Goals as well. So again, another way that consumers can engage um, with, with businesses and also know that they're working towards SDGs. Um, so when consumers support movements like fair trade and like B Corp, um, when they buy fair trade products, so coffee is just one product, it can also be coffee cocoa, tea, bananas, or B Corp certified businesses. Um, so probably the best known one is Patagonia, Athleta, Ben & Jerry's, there's a wealth of them. They're directly supporting progress towards SDGs um, because they really look at the entire value chain and all the stakeholders involved. So people, planet, and profit need to be viewed equally as important as equally important in a truly sustainable business. And when that is done, it is one way, and I would argue a very powerful way to stay, sustain momentum towards these goals. So this is one way that even when we are at home, maybe more often than, than we normally are, there's still ways to feel like as a consumer that you can engage with uh, products and support businesses that also support uh, progress towards UN uh, SDGs. Um, and the last part of our conversation, and I really loved this, is, you know, I think numbers and stats and benchmarking, all of these are really important to understand how we're moving towards S SDGs, but we talked about um, stories as well, and I think stories are a really powerful way and, uh, to gain excitement and, and to make those numbers come into to real, the real world. So we talked about um, um, one of our favorite movement leaders and how their example can, can inform um SDGs. Um, so each of the panelists was was uh, asked to share a story. So I'll just share a very short story. But the the movement leader that I talked of was uh, his name is Rodolfo Panoba. He's a manager of a producer cooperative in Honduras, and he is one of um, which is one of the cooperatives that Peace Coffee has purchased from for for a long time now. Um, so very quickly, one of one of Combs's job this cooperative is to, to get members to understand the importance of organic and regenerative agriculture. And so when members are coming in, they maybe have been farming in a conventional method. How do you start to teach them how to produce coffee in a more sustainable way? And so they kind of highlight the five M's. So one, they're very agronomic, you know, organic material and microorganisms and minerals and living molecules. And then the fifth M, and this is the most important M and the most difficult aspect to master is your gray matter, your mind. So keeping an open mind. And I think this is, again, something really important when we're talking about building a better world and creating radical change and questioning the status quo, all of which are needed um, to, to move towards the SDGs, but are also inherently part of movements. You need to keep an open mind um, and continue to learn and engage. And that is a difficult aspect to master, but one that can create um, a ton of change and a lot of excitement. So these are just some of the pieces that we talked about um, during our panel. Uh, it is a hard time, I think, for everyone with COVID, but there is a lot of good work to be done and a lot of amazingly talented people doing it. So just having access to these conversations and um, being connected with like-minded individuals, all working on different things, um, is, is provided with me with a lot of excitement and. Um, optimism for the future and moving forward. Thank you so much, Ann. It seems like you had a both an inspiring day, but it also you were able to bring the stories from Peace Coffee, which really was one of the very first of those fair trade coffee, and also the B Corp. So uh, thank you for that report and, uh, and reminding people these are recorded. You can go see these. So uh, we're going to come back to some questions, but we're going to move now. Uh, Adriana, Alejandro is the philanthropy officer here in the local office of UNICEF here in the Twin Cities. And um, uh, UNICEF has been one of the most active international agencies on the sustainable development goals and sustainable development in general. And especially in this time of COVID, there's a lot of integration of these. Take it away. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and actually, thank you so much, Kristen, who we'll be, we'll be hearing about um, later for this fantastic convening that we had uh, with Goldmakers. 
I, I would be remiss to say that I'm excited and I'm a proud uh, member of Global Minnesota. I'm thankful for all the uh, programming that you have here in, in Minnesota. And thank you so much for inviting UNICEF to so many, uh, so many spaces where we could share the, the amazing work that we do. Uh, my name is Adriana Alejandro and I am a proud staff member at UNICEF USA where we're advancing the global mission of UNICEF by rallying the American public to show support for the world's most vulnerable children as we relentlessly pursue an equitable world for every child. It was so, I, you all heard, um, Anne gave a really wonderful summary of our, of our movement building uh, session where admittedly also it was followed by the next gen, which I highly encourage everybody to go back and, and listen because it cemented what we're all about, that young people are not the future leaders, but the current leaders and their movement builders and why we should listen to them because we are living in their world. The question that was uh, brought up to me uh, in order you know, to, to start the dialogue is how can we combat the sentiment of global engagement um, with the growing wave of nationalism and what's the role of uh, educating uh, citizens in global citizenship. Uh, and this is just so important. I feel like you cannot turn on the news um, or you cannot speak to anybody when, and, and not hear about all these themes. And UNICEF is obviously committed to cultivating um, an American constituency worth empathy, um, where this empathy will grow across the world because we need to care about the inter international space as much as our own. Um, and it's actually really great that Global Minnesota is not only uh, educating its uh, adult members, but its young members as well in uh, global citizenship. And we even have so many organizations here uh, that are building curriculum uh, because of higher, uh, our high, high diaspora communities and because of internationalness, because we need to understand this global uh, interdependence. We need to build back uh, respect and, and these values that value diversity. Um, we have the ability to challenge injustice and inequities um, and then take action in a way that's personally meaningful. One of the sessions that I attended, uh, uh, I listened to Secretary Glickman mentioning some of the harmful things about the American first um, effect in this current administration, be it the Muslim ban or getting out of the Paris Accord, which had you know, drastic uh, consequences that increase populism and nationalism and isolationism, then global citizenship combats this with creativity and innovation and a commitment to peace and human rights. And human rights, uh, and particularly as it relates to UNICEF, we always and constantly mention, and I love how Anne mentioned, broadcast the message that SDGs cannot be realized without realizing children's rights. We just can't. Um, actually, by the end of the Millennium Development Goals, progress had been made um, with poverty reduction and drinking water access, but a significant uneven process was made without children, so it left millions of children behind. So UNICEF actually helped shape the 17 SDGs to reach every child, tackling poverty, ach achieving gender equity, ending violence against children, ending uh, preventable child disease and maternal deaths, and empowering adolescents to break uh, the cycle of chronic uh, crisis. In a pre-COVID world, uh, UNICEF amplifies children's voices and decision-making powers, um, helping SDGs to call on governments to mitigate uh, different uh, risks. But in the post-COVID world, we need radical imagination. And one of the best ways that we could do this is give children a seat at the table uh, where they could be engaged and where they could be heard. Uh, be it with UNICEF's Innovative U Report, which empowers adolescents to hold leaders accountable. Um, they report sexual exploitation in schools or shortages of drugs in local clinics, or uh, UNICEF's Voices of Youth, with it, which is an outlet that allows uh, children and adolescents to share some of their visions of how mental health is, is one of their biggest crises right now and build community in it. Uh, UNICEF has over 800 uh, UNICEF clubs in the United States and 40 states, actually many of them in Minnesota, and we empower the American teens and college students and young professionals to advocate for these children's rights. Um, and whether it's global priorities like the Global Child Thrive Act or keeping girls in school or domestic priorities as well, um, we have been uh, supporting children's voices on the DREAM Act or Justing and Policing. And in Minnesota, we're one of the four states that actually 
ban child marriage because youth voices were at this table. But one of the things that I'm most proud of in Minnesota that aligns to the SGDs as a child's rights based uh, uh, program is the Child Friendly Cities Initiative, because we believe that if policymakers and communities put children first and listen to their voices, they make better decisions. Um, UNICEF Child Friendly Cities enhances the cities to uh, prioritize the needs in children and elevate their voices from birth to 18 years. Um, and through uh, this program, which is new to the United States, and actually we Minnesota or Minneapolis rather just became one of the five cities that is piloting this program has been uh, in, in existence for over two uh, decades and there's 3500 uh, municipalities in over 40 countries. And then from climate change to demand some racial justice children have consistently shown that they're cap capable actors to deserve um, their ideas to be heard. And creating a child-friendly city does not only benefit children, but it equally focuses on the well-being of the wider community, cities, and future generations. This is one of the many places where private sectors, uh, where we need private sector partnerships. And fortunately, we are working towards um, working with the private sector to, to fund these programs because these movements and these activities need funding. Um, actually, COVID, as as you probably know, uh, child poverty is expected to be higher than pre-COVID levels for at least five years. And despite countries spending approximately $10 billion or almost $10.8 billion or $11 billion in COVID response in the last six months, only 2% was specifically dedicated to support children and families. Uh, businesses first, 90% uh, of the money went to them, but children were overlooked. And long-term family-focused policies are needed. And that's, in, again, aligning to SDG. This is one of the many things that UNICEF is doing to align and to make progress for the SDGs. Other programs uh, that UNICEF, where UNICEF is making advancement to the SDGs is joint mechanisms of investment with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where we're establishing a strategy uh, for 2030 to accelerate efforts uh, towards achieving SDG 3 in priority countries to support reduction of maternal and newborn deaths. And it's really exciting because it lays the groundwork where we build up to 2030 and generally it's more flexible and catalytic. Uh, the program where I'm most excited, again, aligning to the SDG is this UNICEF and Facebook's uh, recent partnership where we launched this global partnership um, that is anchored on four pillars that is focusing on health, education, online safety, and capacity building. Um, we know that in order to reach these goals, we need to tackle specific issues. So in goal three, we're partnering in efforts under like health and well-being pillar. Uh, on goal four, we're um, focusing on education and social cohesion. Uh, on goal 10, we're uh, focusing on uh, reduction of inequalities as a cross-cutting for all pillars. And then of course, 17, a cross-cutting goal that intersects the four pillars in itself. Although health is a core pillar, um, Facebook is supporting immunization and uh, programs and campaigns that are working together to advance credible and evidence-based information across the platforms. Because this is not news, 2.7 billion people are in the platform and some countries almost exclusively use Facebook as, uh, their population uses Facebook as a, as a news source. And there's so much risk of misinformation. Misinformation is probably the, that's the strongest weapon we, we have right now. Uh, ultimately, uh, COVID is, you know, a children's crisis. We have overburdened, overburdened systems. We have pandemic restrictions. Children are out of school. Um, and even before, COVID, conflict and climate change were driving an unprecedented growth in number of children needing humanitarian assistance. Uh, but we are who we are because we don't stop. Uh, there is absolute reason for hope. Um, one of them, which Mark mentioned, uh, the COVAX facility, which is UNICEF's is helping to lead, is going to deliver the vaccine safely and affordably for all countries in need. Um, and like Anne mentioned, uh, we are stronger when we work together. Uh, we know that it's all up to all of us to make the world better and more equal and more peaceful place for all, and we won't stop until that's done. Uh, really, really excited to share this with uh, the nation's uh, global makers um, forum, and uh, thank you so much for listening.
Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Adriana. And I'm just thrilled to hear about that big focus on SDG3, which is, of course, good health and well being for all. And it's also the theme of our planned World Expo or World's Fair in the summer of 2027. We'll have a chance to see how we're doing and make that final three year sprint. Uh, looking forward to working with UNICEF and going to make sure you get one of our uh, mugs, our SDG mugs here. Now we're moving to um, Alexandra Spieldock, who is the president and CEO of Bountafield International. Uh, she's um, been a leading force for decades on the policies that we approach the international community from our trade policy, agriculture policy, focusing on Bountafield's special niche of making sure that small landholders in Africa have the technology they need that works for them to help reduce waste and to increase the sustainability of the whole system and to change the system at the same time. So glad you could be here with us today. Take it away, Zan. Okay, can you hear me and can yep. you see me? Can you hear me and see me? We cannot see you yet, but that's uh, sometimes that happens. But we okay. can hear you fine. Okay. Well, thank you for um, that introduction, Mark, and it's such an honor to be part of uh, today's panel and part of this really historical um, process. As Mark said, um, I have been working on these issues for many years now, and it is um, so wonderful to be um, seeing this kind of dynamic, interestingly, you know, the online dynamic also created with the with this COVID experience that has in many ways, you know, brought us closer together and allowed us to have some really targeted discussions. And thanks to Global Minnesota for the um, the strong leadership you role, role that you play globally, nationally, and also here in Minnesota. And I should tell you, I always tell this story a little bit when I when I'm in a new space that I in part moved to Minnesota because I wanted to work with Mark Ritchie and um, he's um, always been an inspiration to me. So it's a genuine honor. As Mark mentioned, um, I'm Alexandra Spieldock and I'm the CEO of Bounty Field International. Bounty Field International is an organization that's based in Minneapolis. Um, we uh, specialize in post-harvest processing technology for smallholder markets. And um, we actually came out of General Mills back in the early 80s around the whole movement around appropriate technology. And we have been very heavily focused on how to increase the quality and quantity of food in local and national markets in developing country contexts. Um, and how can technology uh, play a positive role? And, and how do we kind of continue to turn the box around what distribution challenges are out there and how do we um, ensure that any kind of, um, you know, market-led activity is also linked with the, uh, with sustainable development and uh, with social and environmental development goals. We have a vision that Africa can feed herself and um, part of the way in which Africa can feed herself is also with the, the introduction of a basic technology and also um, a focus on um, production of crops that grow well in the region, that are nutritious, that do not require um, you know, large amounts of water and intensive production methods. And, um, and then most importantly, of course, on the post-harvest side, um, that are handled and processed and preserved in a way so that we can greatly reduce food loss and also, um, again, contribute to economic growth and inclusive growth. So uh, I want to also just acknowledge Global Washington. I was honored to participate in our panel, which was looking at zero hunger, of course, but it was also looking at the, the questions around natural capital and the intersectionality of resources. So looking at, obviously you cannot grow food if you don't have land and if you don't have water. So um, in, important to be thinking comprehensively 
um, at all levels around how uh, we are managing land, how are we safeguarding water and energy, looking at renewable energy and its role in developing country markets, and of course, um, sustainable food production and, and preservation and, and distribution. And I think that, um, you know, these are, there are, there are major challenges that, um, that we've seen over and over again in terms of uh, particularly um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where smallholder farmers lack access to a, a variety of things, including capital and um, information, basic innovation, and, um, and access to markets. And so, you know, simply dropping off a piece of technology doesn't work. Um, some of the historical ways in which we've approached uh, more sustainable uh, local food markets have not worked. So there are opportunities for us to do, uh, to do more and to do it better. So our group, interestingly, um, we were coming at our, you know, this discussion from different sectors. We were talking about fisheries. We were talking about staple crop production in, in the case of Bounty Field. And then we were also talking about solar energy um, on our panel as well trying to um, understand some of the linkages and some of the gaps in, in developing country supply chains. And supply chains in terms of su supply of food, where there are bottlenecks in food supply that are, that are deeply challenging, but also supply uh, chain bottlenecks with technology recognizing that there may be demand for new innovation, but there has been major challenge in introducing new innovation or, or appropriate um, innovation into, um, into certain markets, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that there are major challenges with the distribution, both of food and of technology. And so that while it may not be the sexiest topic, at least on the surface, when you get into it, it gets pretty sexy, I think. Um, but you know, supply chain really matters. And if we're talking about a market-led approach or increased role of the private sector, then we need to actually be thinking in, in targeted and strategic ways about how to link uh, the private sector to the work that we're doing, whether it's uh, food buyers, um, technology suppliers, uh, agri-dealers for different types of innovation, and, and so on. The other thing that we talked about was around um, the importance of gender equality and initiatives to really invest in women um, in agribusiness, for example, and efforts to reduce the amount of labor and drudgery that women experience on a daily basis with regard to um, everything related to preparing food for their families and for their communities. And so, um, you know, linking the sustainable development goals um, in terms of on, on multiple levels, but certainly bringing gender equality into a much more central role around zero hunger and um, incredible opportunity there that I think has not been capitalized on in the past and um, also new and important opportunities to create employment for youth uh, where there has been this incredible migration out of the rural sector into urban areas this in and of itself is unsustainable and that part of what the work um, ahead really requires is to create new job uh, opportunity, new capacity, new knowledge uh, for youth so that they have a reason to stay in the rural sector and a way for them to stay connected also to, to production. So it doesn't have to be um, farming uh, with a hand hoe. It can also be off farm, uh, small scale business development. And this is uh, really exciting and, and I think critical work in terms of that, what is often referred to as the missing middle, the opportunity to really dig in and invest in these micro um, enterprises within the rural sector as a way, as a strategy to achieve um, zero hunger. 
And then lastly, we talked about the important role of governments. I mean, obviously there are um, key uh, subsidies and investments that, uh, that are well received from governments. In many cases, actually, they had them historically and removed them to open up for, for global trade. So looking at the kinds of domestic supports that would support, that would promote, um, you know, uh, local procurement of food, for example, and, uh, you know, some kind of early phase investment or patient capital also coming from the private sector for some of the market actors so that they feel more confidence to invest in smallholders and to invest in, um, again, sustainable and nu nutritious food production. So I think there were a lot of really important um, components in our panel. It was, as I say, an honor. We looked at, obviously, the, the importance of um, eradicating poverty, the linkages with zero hunger and consumption and production. And on the consumption side, of course, um, reduction of meat on the, in developed countries, reducing demand for um, you know, global meat trade and focusing on the kind of production that will really be the most sustaining um, and long-term for people and the planet. And we spent a lot of time talking about infrastructure and also, uh, again, the importance of inclusive growth also as a strategy for resilience. And um, we know this year has been one that has really brought this to the fore and, and it's hard to even talk about this work without also talking about resilience. Um, I think we were asked to give an example. There were numerous examples that were given in our panel. Um, I'm not sure I have enough time to really say much. I know in our case, uh, for example, Bounty Field International is, um, is, is really working closely with, um, with micro entrepreneurs, with post-harvest technology and, and service packages. And for example, we have um, been able to unlock some financing and to invest in a, in a woman micro entrepreneur in the Eastern part of Kenya. We have equipped her with a multi-crop thresher um, that she's primarily using for sorghum at this time. And with this uh, thresher, she's been able to process sorghum for large numbers of farmers in her surrounding area. She's been able to not only increase her own revenue, but create, she's hired two operators to work with her. She's using what isn't the grain itself, the actual shaft from, that's coming out of the, the processing for fodder. She's, um, the farmers around her are increasing their production levels of sorghum, and they are now also increasing their access to the local market. And I think that's an example, again, of a comprehensive approach that's also looking at the, all of the multiple facets of, of sustainability and um, happy to take any questions and that's talk further great, about this. Great example. And we'll come back because uh, we'll have some time at the end for questions. But thank you. Thank you for that overview. And what a rich, a complex, and comprehensive discussion you got to have at that national forum. That's great. I have the great honor and privilege, and it makes me very happy to introduce the CEO of Global Washington, Kristen Daly, whose idea this was. Uh, she'll tell you some of the origins, perhaps. Uh, but the, uh, the goal was to bring pieces from different corners of the country into a national conversation, not as an end point, but as the beginning point. Kristen, take it away. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been quite a journey. And I'll try to be brief so that we can save some time for Q&A. But um, as Mark mentioned, um, Global Washington, we're based in Seattle. So not Washington, DC, but the other Washington. And we are very similar to Global Minnesota. Uh, we are actually a network of nonprofits and for-profits that have a presence in Washington state and do work to improve lives in low and middle income countries. So. We have some of the largest NGOs like PATH and World Vision and companies like Microsoft and Starbucks. We also have members that are headquartered outside of Washington State but have staff in, what, in Washington State such as Oxfam and CARE and Save the Children. 
So uh, just as background to tell you a little bit about the arc of how we got to this national forum, um, Global Washington embraced the SDGs about two years ago as a framework to spotlight the work of our members. So we organized monthly issue campaigns around the SDGs. So we would pick one SDG and then a subtopic under that SDG, cluster our members that were working on that issue and did uh, profiles of each of the members. Uh, we organized uh, convenings around those topics and pushed out interviews that we've been doing and organized small roundtables in Seattle when we were doing those in person. Um, so fast forward to March of this year, things changed quite a bit as we know. And Global Washington really tried to embrace digital technology. We pivoted all of our programming online, just like Global Minnesota did, but really started to think about how, think creatively on how we could actually expand what we do using virtual and digital technology. We had already started talking to partners in other cities that were similar. And as many things, COVID just advanced the ideas that we wanted to do and out of necessity. So we started thinking about what if we took the SDGs and really tried to put a sharper lens on who's doing what. Global Washington is really about the practitioners, those goal makers, that's why we say that. The practitioners that are advancing the SDGs, so those headquartered in the US, but that play a, a pivotal role in advancing the SDGs in low and middle income countries. So we also had been talking to uh, Brookings and Rockefeller Foundation, who came up uh, two years ago, came up with this concept called 17 Rooms. So they would convene people in person in uh, New York City around the UN General Assembly. And they would physically put people in rooms and do a deep dive on each of the SDGs and then mix around the rooms. So Global Washington, uh, myself and my board really sat down and talked about how we could uh, uh, utilize virtual and create a 17 rooms in that way and really more focus it on the practitioners. Uh, Brookings and Rockefeller are amazing at bringing together the thought leaders around this, the, the World Bank, the, the UN officials and um, others, but we wanted to uh, democratize the conversation and Brookings right now had always wanted to do this. So we're, we're on the same path with them and Rockefeller. So uh, we became partners with them to really try to figure out how to democratize the conversation around 17 rooms. So uh, we reached out to Mark and Global Minnesota. So it's definitely one of our cities in this. The other cities, we have Minneapolis, Seattle, Denver, Los Angeles, Boston, New York, and Atlanta. So it, it happened very quickly as things did this year. Uh, we decided that we wanted to use the 17 rooms model to spark conversations and partnerships. So we worked with our partners who convened 13 roundtables that covered all 17 of the SDGs. And we had over 200 thought leaders and participants in all of the roundtables. And um, it, then the concept of obviously became that one person from each of the round tables would come to a national forum that was virtual uh, to talk about what they learned, but really to figure out that's where we tried to look at the cross cutting issues that emerged from each of those round tables. So as you just heard, um, Alexandra, participated in one of the breakout sessions around natural capital and sustainability with two other people who participated in roundtables in other cities. And uh, Anne and Adriana participated in a breakout session at the National Forum, Forum around movement building. Uh, the other cross-cutting themes that really emerged from all of these roundtable conversations going on included ensuring and just recovery, feminist leadership, disruption and leapfrogging for a better future, and effective partnerships and social capital. 
So the, the national forum that we organized um, just, just a little while ago this month uh, was actually our 12th annual national uh, convening. All the other ones had been in person and in Seattle, uh, but we thought that this was a perfect way to really sharpen what we do for the SDGs and bring people together and inspire others in other cities. Um, I'm happy to provide a link to what were um, the, the next gen uh, session that Mark mentioned, because it was uh, one of the most inspiring uh, sessions we had. I can also provide links to uh, both uh, Alexandra and Ann and Adriana's um, session that they did. We don't have all the sessions out there publicly because it was a benefit of paying for a ticket to go to the National Forum but um, I'm happy to provide those through Mark. We'll get those out to you. So what's next? Um, we've had so many conversations and such great content and people coming together to really spark ideas. However, we know that just one convening is not going to produce the results we really want. Uh, we really want to deepen these conversations so that we really can move toward reaching the SDGs. So we're talking right now with Brookings and Rockefeller because they have their own working groups. There is some overlap with our roundtable convening uh, participants, but we hope that in next year, we'll talk about how we can deliberately um, align these two groups so that we can expand the conversation, expand the ideas that are going into solving these problems. Uh, we're also going to get the, the city host uh, back together in January and really decide what they wanna do. The whole concept behind this that Global Washington wanted is that each city can take this and own this and figure out what they wanna do. So I think Mark, that's your challenge and I'm sure you're gonna engage people on this call. There, we'll figure out how to support each other. This is an ongoing uh, network that we want to continue. But there's many different aspects of the SDGs and the 17 rooms model, this goal maker model that we could all do. Um, Mark might want to do something on different SDGs, convene a group um, around global health, for example. So uh, there's lots of different conversations that we can do around this. There's also um, another movement that's happening, taking the SDGs to local and domestic issues. The United States has to reach the SDGs as well. It's, it's one of the countries that uh, around the world that we need to focus on as well. So that might be an area for each of our cities in the partnership to really take the SDGs and the 17 rooms kind of toolkit and figure out how to reach those within their own city, within their own state. So January and February is going to be the, the time when we really figure out how to advance uh, what we wanted, what we started this year. As Mark said, this is only a beginning for the potential. What we do know is that we're going to be creating a report that is a compilation of ideas that came out of each of the roundtables and that fed into the national forum. So that report from Global Washington will be coming out in January. Um, I'm also happy I can share with you all a report that Rockefeller and Brookings did recently on their 17 rooms. And again, you'll see very similar uh, cross-cutting themes coming forward with all of this. Um, and we're, we're also really excited that what we're going to do in 2021 will also be benchmarked with our next national forum that we already have a date, save the date for all of you. It's December 9th, 2021. So we are going to be doing activities uh, leading up to that, that started with the roundtables this year and then continuing on in 2021, going into our national forum on December 9th in 2021. So um, I might pause there and uh, leave time for Q&A, if that makes sense, Mark. Yes, thank you so much. And okay, December 9th, 
I can remember that. It's just about, you know, Pearl Harbor Day. Or we're, we watch that up here. I want to remind people that there'll be a lot of STG discussion at our upcoming International Day of Education. So a lot of you came to World Food Day last October, January 25th, STG 4, early to late, all kinds of speakers led by UNESCO, who's the lead, et cetera. So check out the website at Global Minnesota, get signed up and think about that. Before we have a question, I want to give a special shout out to our friends from St. Cloud State, Katherine Johnson, and the program there around the Confucian Center. Uh, the university provided us today a very special uh, gift, a gift of, of um, language translation, and some of you could see the subtitles, uh, so that our deaf friends can participate in these programs, and it's a big uh, opportunity for us to make our mindset and our ability and our change happen. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, St. Cloud State. So I'd like to invite all the panelists and friends to uh, uh, come back on with your, um, unmute your video and unmute your um, audio. And I have a question. Those of you who were there, all of you, what about next December 9th? What would you like make you smile and make you happy if next November 9th you look back and said, oh, that happened. That really happened. What would it be? I, I'm, I'm happy to share that I would love all the vaccine rollout procedures to go smoothly for vaccine misinformation to decline so all of us could uh, do better, like Anne mentioned, when we all do better. This is one of the easiest and most uh, important technologies that actually saved more lives in the 20th century, uh, and we could do it. Uh, I would love for everybody to share uh, proudly that they've been vaccinated uh, so COVID uh, loads can start going down. Amen. Anne. That that it would be, I, I'm going to jump on that one and answer that as well. I think that's first and foremost, in order to make a lot of progress, we need to figure out ways that we can come together in person safely and have these conversations. You know, digital world is awesome and that's reduced a lot of barriers to participate in events like this. But on the other hand, we do need to have that safety come back to our communities, both locally and globally, to really start getting moving on, on addressing the SDGs. Alexandra? Yeah, I'm sorry, you guys can't see me, but um, I wanna just mirror what the other two said. I think the vaccine is so critical for being able to, um, to be able to get back to some level of normalcy in, in terms of the, the economy working and people being able to feel safe. And um, it's, just a, it's just, it's absolutely um, at the top of our, of our list as well. Um, you know, health versus the economy. We've seen in Africa, for example, that um, the, the economy is really the, the, the piece that's the scariest part of the, the impact here. And so we, you know, Africa, for example, many parts anyway, have not experienced the same kind of terrible impact that we've seen in places like the United States and in Europe. And, but they are experiencing major shocks and, and, and terrible challenges with regard to, um, you know, to the economy and to food being available. So I think we need to make sure that we're also looking at not only the vaccine, but also investment going into more resilience in, um, in local economies and rural areas. Yeah, Kristen. Yeah, I, I fully agree with, with that. Uh, one thing though that we talked about at the National Forum a lot is that um, we don't want to go back to the status quo in terms of, of after we have a vaccine, after things open up. We have this moment in time right now to build back to a different future, a better future. And as, as many of you um, mentioned here, uh, we need to think about equity in a new way. Um, we can't let this, this moment in time uh, be wasted. We really need to figure out in global development in particular and in our cities, uh, figure out how to think about things differently and what that means for 
global development is this concept of decolonization. We need to figure out how to do things differently that's more equitable, uh, shifting decision making and, and changing the power imbalance we have now. So uh, a year from now, I hope it doesn't look like it did uh, two years ago in terms of how we are actually doing our programming. I hope that people are really um, using this moment to change structurally how they deliver services, how they uh, look at leadership and decision making within nonprofits, within uh, grant making, within uh, corporate structures. So uh, that's one thing I really uh, hope that we, we think about differently so we don't just build back to the status quo, but we build back for more equity. I really appreciate this sort of kind of focus on this building a better future. One of the things I've been aware of through some of the reports, UNICEF in particular, but is that um, the rollout of the vaccine at the current situation puts the poorest countries out in 2023 and many countries out in 2022. And so that's an unacceptable uh, inequity and we need to be uh, doing everything we can to challenge that as part of it. I hope next December we will have said, oh, we got it done. And so let, let's put our minds to that. Today's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, panel discussion. And Kristen, again, thank you. Thank you to the whole team at Global Minnesota that made this happen. Thank you again to St. Cloud State. Don't forget International Day of Education, January 25th. Check out that website of Global Minnesota and check out Global Washington. Thank you, everybody. Good day.